Hello and welcome to Senior Moment. My name is David Refson. I am your host for the show. Senior Moment is about seniors and for seniors. I am very pleased to have as my guest today Margaret Lloyd. Uh, Margaret is a, a poet, a painter, an artist, uh, does work on Slate, and we're going to talk about some of that later. So I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you. Okay. So tell me about your kind of early sort of life and history, uh, about you being born where you were and how your connection with Wales as an overarching part of your life. Yes. I was born in Liverpool, England, because my father was a minister in a Welsh Presbyterian Church in England. In England, my, both of my parents were Welsh, my father from the north, my mother from the south, and Liverpool was often thought of as the capital of North Wales because there were so many Welsh people there. And the church he was a minister of had 750 people in at the time, which was huge, full of Welsh people. He preached in Welsh every Sunday, amazing, you know, four-part harmony when they sang hymns. So um, I was born there, and one sort of side thing I like to tell people about is that the church faced Penny Lane. Oh. So that later on, you know, when I fell in love with the Beatles, I, I, there was that association as well. But um, I was two when we emigrated to the States okay. from Liverpool. What, what, I understand your folks are from there, but it seems like yeah. you just have a, an incredible kind of um, involvement with Wales yes. as part of your life. Yes. So maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, well, what, the reason that we emigrated to the state is that he was called to be the minister of a Welsh Presbyterian church in central New York State. And so we were supposed to only stay for five years, but um, you know, obviously we ended up living here. And at that point, central New York State was a hub of Welsh cultural life because so many Welsh people had emigrated in the 19th century to that part of New York because of farming, I think, largely. So I grew up in this church that had, was a largely a Welsh congregation there. And um, I, Welsh was the language of my home. Welsh speak? is my first language. Do you speak it? And I speak Welsh. Okay. I speak largely conversational Welsh. I wouldn't claim I would understand a lecture or a sermon, but day-to-day um, -day conversational Welsh I'm pretty good at. And my mother died a few years ago at the age of 97, and I spoke Welsh with her every day on the phone, which is a great pleasure keeping up the language in that way. Over the years, we went back to Wales. All my relatives were in Wales. Uh, when we came over on the St. Mary the Ocean Liner, it was my father, my mother, my older brother Gareth, and me. And then there were two more children born over here, my two younger brothers. But all my other relatives were in Wales, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. Well, some in England, some in... New Zealand and Australia, but largely in Wales. So um, they would visit us in Utica, New York, and we would visit them. And so there was always a deep, deep connection with Wales. And uh, my mother, I think, always longed for Wales. Um, I think my father was a bit more independent. But there's this Welsh word called hiraith, which is hard to translate, but it means longing. And it's often used, you know, longing for your old, for the old country. And she felt that way. Is, is it my understanding that your uh, lineage goes back a very, very long time? Is that yes, true? yes. It's traced back to the 11th century. I have a cousin who's um, uh, who's a librarian, but very interested in family trees, and so he's a source of great information around that. So it's yeah, it's a very old family in Wales, the Lloyds. In in Welsh, it would be Lloyd which means pale or gray, and the anglicized version is Lloyd. So I have a cousin whose name is Reynacht Lloyd. Got to get that double L sound <laughs> right. in. And yeah, it's a very old family. Wow, quite interesting. On both sides, really, but I'm, I know more about my father's side of the family. And you, you mentioned you go back there quite often. Every summer now, yeah. I, we couldn't, when we had um, two young children, we didn't go back 
all the time. But now we go back every summer. And my husband is a Welsh medievalist, so he's published books over there and does work over there. And two years ago, I published my fourth book of poems over there. It won a, a grant from the Welsh Books Council and got published, which was thrilling to me because all my other books were published in the States. And so to have one published in Wales just felt like the country was really opening up its arms to me. Wow, very interesting to say the least. So tell me about your early writing, how you got involved, just writing in general. We'll talk about poetry in a minute because I know that's a yeah. mainstay for you. But how yeah. did that get started for you, just to yeah. be a, a writer? You know, I have a uh, clipping from the Utica Observer Dispatch uh, with a photograph of my father and me when we had just come to the country. I was two years old sitting on his lap. And what was he reading to me? The <laughs> Child's Garden of Verses, okay. uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. Yes. So, you know, I, like, I look at that and I think, okay, lots of children are read poetry, but I think maybe it was the beginning, you know, the love of rhythm and rhyme and poetry. So, um, Literature was very important in my family, uh, books in every room, um, people read. Uh, my father was a great preacher, words were really important. I remember him walking back and forth in the living room memorizing his sermons. And be, so I, there was always a sense that the words were really important. And so I read a lot and I wrote as a child. And there was this, in our, I, we lived in the manse, which is the minister's home, and there was a little um, bushes on the side of the house and I made a little bower in the bushes and I would crawl in there and I would read and I would write because it also felt like there was something secret and magical about it. So I think I've been writing my whole life really. Did you, um, did you get published with your early writing before poetry or was it strictly writing to poetry? I did, I did publish a couple of stories, fiction, okay. but I, I, I think I'm a poet. I, oh, you know, I came back to poetry. It's like exercise. I keep going back to yoga. It's what I like the best, because that's what I do. Okay. Yeah. So poetry became your life's work. And before we get into some of your reading, I want just to read something here. So I thought it kind of encapsulates you to some extent. Uh, this is Margaret's book. It's called Forge Light. It is a book of poetry. And there's a gentleman named Jack Gilbert. He's the author of Collected Poems and a finalist for the 2013 Pulitzer Prize. This is what he said. I've always been impressed by the consistent high quality of Margaret Lloyd's poem. The matter is always substantial and always accompanied by her excellent craft. She has a distinctive voice, but in addition, the voice is supple. The poems are nuanced beyond themselves. They create a lasting resonance. They produce an oddness that works as a shadow and multiplier of something elusive and foreign under the decorum. Having met with you before a little bit, I think to some extent this encapsulates <laughs> you and who you are in your poetry. I really mm. do. So poetry you. started to become your life's work. It clearly has for sure. And we are very honored to have you read some of your poetry. So if you'd like to do some of that, sure. that would be absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Yes, I'll read from the book Forged Light okay. that, you, that you were just reading the blurb from. Yes. Forged Light also has paintings of mine in, I want to point out. Um, and I, the poem, I, it was difficult to choose. I knew you wanted me to read a couple of poems, which ones to read. But I chose this poem. It's called A World Wanting a Voice. And it's written in form, terza rima, which is an Italian form. Usually I write in free verse, but this one is in terza rima, so I thought I would read that. And one of my, as with many poets, you know, one of my great subjects is, is uh, love. And um, this, but this poem is actually more about why um, I wanted to write, that writing was a drive deep in me. And it has my children in it. And that, of course, there was always this part of my life, my everyday life, and then there was my writing life, the part that called me to be a poet. And that's what this is about. That's what this is a poem about. Okay. A world wanting a voice. I wore white. Their winter boots were muddy 
but I took the children in my arms to climb the hill home because they were tired. Three bodies moving together like one hymn sung slowly by a small congregation. That was years ago in late spring. Farmers were planting corn while the sun shone. But out of the far corner of my eye, the magnolia blossoms looked like snow, a snow that later fell out of the sky, dumb and cold, absolute in its demand, blinding me on that same hill where I had struggled with the children's weight, my mind intent on home. A world wanting a voice, wanting hours, days, years, the passage of time measured by the passing of nights, close to words and the shifting moon, wanting to bind hands and eyes, to take away any choice and send me singing into the snow, blind and failing, leaving the first world behind. Beautiful. Thank you. I hasten to add that I was not leaving my children behind, <laughs> but it's about the two different kinds of worlds that I was dealing with, the domestic world, my love for my children, and then my love for poetry and wanting to, uh, wanting to be able to express my voice. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to read one other one, but uh, I'm a little curious. I, I know if you're writing a novel, uh, people have a particular subject or an area they want to write about. It could be a mystery, it could be whatever. Where do you get your inspiration from for your poetry? You've written a lot of poetry. What's, what's your inspiration, either for this one in particular or just generally? Where, do you, where does that come from? Yeah, well, in this particular poem, I think, first of all, I hasten to add that I often don't know where a poem is going when I start it. You know, I'm, I'm working with images. I was working with form at this point, too, so yeah. that also helps find the subject. Writing about this experience of, you know, picking my children up in my arms in the winter and struggling with them because they won't walk and I have to carry them home. <laughs> and and yeah. starting with that, but where is my mind really? What's also going on inside of me? So in this case, it was expressing a part of my life. And so the inspir if one to call it inspiration or the impetus or the beginning of the poem was there as of my life as a mother, as a parent, but then where did it go? I discovered that as the poem went on. It went to my life as a poet. It meant to the drive to write. It went to the drive to express my voice. So each poem, I recently was in Pittsburgh where Jack Gilbert was born. Oh and um, visiting my daughter who recently moved there and I ended up writing a poem about an experience that I'd had picking up um, her partner's child from school and it just started there I didn't really know where it was going so it often starts with something in my life but I hasten to add the two of my books are persona poems and so the book that I'm going to read from next are, it's called A Moment in the Field, Voices from Arthurian Legend, and it's all uh, voices of various characters having to do with King Arthur. I speak from King Arthur, Lancelot, Merlin, Guinevere, Elaine of Astolat, um, many different women's voices, probably more women's voices than men. And so, th you know, the inspiration there was um, Mallory's Mort Arthur, which I'd been reading, mm -hmm. The Death of Arthur. And so I got inspired by that and wrote those poems. Starting with one poem, I had no idea I was going to write a whole book of poems. You did, and many more. Yeah. I, I, I have imposed upon Margaret to read another poem, and I'm glad she is going to do that because your poetry is beautiful. So this is a poem from this book I was just talking about. And let me see. The poem is divided into sections, and this poem I'm going to read about, which is The Maid of Astolat. Let's see if I can find it here. Here it is. Um, there's only one poem in this section, and let me tell you a little bit about Great. who she was. She was a woman who was in love with Lancelot, but it was unrequited love. He didn't return her love 
because he loved Guinevere. I think probably many people are acquainted with the Lancelot Guinevere King Arthur triangle. And so she dies because she's, um, her love isn't, you know, isn't returned. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about this poem, it's free verse, and it's written from the point of view of her when she's dead. And she's floating down a river. She's going from Astolat to London, to Westminster, on a barge rowed by an old man. And she's speaking from the dead as she's floating down this river. So you have to realize that that's what's going on here. Okay. The maid of Astolat. How has word come down of me that I died because I loved, even as he said, too much? What does the image of my body mean to you, dressed in gold cloth, lying on a barge covered with black samite, my arrayed and beautiful, my cold and virgin body floating down the Thames, the river of molten lead, rowed by an old man carrying a letter in my hand to Lancelot, nothing but a fair maid dead for love. When the barge arrived, a swan preened herself in high wind, but my heart was a lake with no wind. My body came over the dark water from Astolat to Westminster and waited for three days. Death ended the argument of my love. Hawking and tournaments resumed as if I had never lived. But didn't I honor God since God made him and wrought every scar on his heroic body? Listen, I loved him the way I loved him, even before I knew his name. And how do you love, you who forget you are dying, who think you are not floating every day down the cold river. What are you asked to live with and to live without? What will the letter in your hand say to the beloved you know on earth, even this very day? I am very moved. <laughs> it is clear why you're a poet. <laughs> it is for these little works. Um, I want to move on a little bit before our time runs out. Sure. Uh, and I want you to talk a bit, uh, for folks who don't know, you are an accomplished artist, a painter. Oh. And we're going to talk about some of your other works in Slate. But how did that get started? I've seen some of your artwork, and it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you chose, um, uh, as a medium, it's eluding me at the moment. It's not watercolor. Art. Watercolor. Watercolor. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, as a medium, which I particularly like myself. So yes. talk a little bit about that. About yes, well, I began painting 11 years ago. Okay. Um, I was in Colorado with some friends, beautiful mountains. And uh, two of my friends uh, were watercolor painters, artists, and they were trying to get me to come out and paint with them because they were going to go look at a mountain and paint. And I was, oh, you know, I said, no, no, I can't do that. And I didn't want to, you know, I said, I'll come with you, but I'm going to hike while you paint. So, but when we got to the spot, they, they gave me a little watercolor set and paints and, and of paints and paper and brushes. And I, so I said, okay, I removed myself from where they were because I didn't want to be totally humiliated. And I looked at this mountain and it was so beautiful. And I started to paint it. And I became obsessed with watercolor painting that whole summer and afterwards for years. And I really still am. So that's how it all started. And I had no idea that I, you know, was accomplished in any way in visual art. So that's how it began. Um, well, I have seen some of your paintings. And yes, you are accomplished <laughs> in that medium for sure. Um, the other part of your art has to do with slate. Yes. And Tell me a little bit about that. Then we're going to go into some of the works that you've done. Uh, also, talking about some of the slate, not all of it, is from Wales itself. Yes. So please do address that. Yes. So about four years ago, I really got interested in working with slate as a medium for my art. And 
wisely, you might ask. Well, my father, my parents, my all my relatives on my father's side, let's put it that way, we've been involved in the slate industry for centuries probably. And my relatives on my mother's side were involved in the coal industry, which is in South Wales. But um, obviously, uh, but slate became the medium I got very, very attracted to. My great grandfather was, I'm sure, a quarryman, went down into the mines. Mm -hmm. And my, turns out my and I didn't know this until fairly recently, that my grandfather was a slate engraver. And of course, I've been engraving on slate. He ended up um, owning two slate mines in North Wales after the war, get bought, borrowed some money, and bought some slate mines. So I've heard about slate my whole life. And when I was young, I remember going to Wales and my two younger brothers got to go down into the mine, but I was not allowed to because I was female and it was bad luck for females to go down into the mines. But four years ago, I actually got to go into a disused uh, mine own, owned by my cousin in Wales. And then I just had this idea of putting my paintings together with slate. So. And also, I just had a show uh, called Slate Works in the Burnett Library in Amherst. And it, for that show, when I was making works, I ended up engraving on slate and actually painting on the slate. Some of the, the slate paintings on watercolor are affixed to the slate, but some is actually embedded. This one is an example of being embedded okay. in the slate. Yeah, pick it up and let's... Um... Let's yeah. show this. Let's see if I can uh, show this here. Yeah, that's called an open book, that, that piece. Okay. And I wanted to talk about this one, too, and I want you to address that one a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's today. a hawk. And I got the image from a medieval tile from Strata, Florida Abbey in Mid Wales, which is one of my favorite places. And what I did was I engraved the hawk into the slate first of all, and then I painted it gold. And so I took something very old, which was the medieval tile, and made it new by engraving it and embedding it on slate, which is also very old. So the work is something about making something old new and reclamation in some way. And I've seen some of your other works too, and you're quite accomplished to say the least. Um, I wanted to just, mentioned briefly two things. One is, what is Group 18? Yeah. yeah, Group 18 has been very important to my life as a poet. It started in 1985, so what are we talking, 30-some years ago, mm -hmm. in Northampton. Um, Linda Gregg and Jim Finnegan founded it, and over the years, many poets have come and go, very accomplished um, writers, uh, many books have been published. Jack Gilbert was a, a really important figure and a very close friend of mine, but a mentor of mine, one of my great, I've, I've had three great teachers. He was one of them. So it, that's why it's pleased me so much to get that blurb from him and because, because of that. So it has met it. In fact, it met at my house last night for all that time. I'm one of the old people who have been in it the longest. And there are two other people in the group, um, Doug Anderson and Bob Coles, who are also old time members, but others joined and some of the members who were there left and came back. And it's, it's just been a very, very vital group. And um, I, I don't know, it, it's amazing it's lasted that long. And we all went to Russia together a few years ago. We went to uh, Skov and uh, we're the Russian Writers' Union there. We'd been invited to go, and we went there and read our poetry, and the Russian poets read their poetry to us. We went to St. Petersburg and got to visit Anna Akhmatova's, she was one of my favorite writers' house, where she was imprisoned because of her political poetry, mm -hmm. and we went to where Dostoevsky's apartment wow. was. So we've, and it just cemented us even more. So we, we critique each, each other's work every week. That's, That's what right. we do. I wanted to mention before we're going to run out of time, two events that are going on. One on March 24th, 
Yes. And the other one on March 31st. So if you can yes. share with us about those, that would be terrific. Yes. Um, group 18, we, we have, it's kind of a rare event where we read together mm -hmm. as a group. We do a lot of individual perf um, readings. But on March 24th at 5 p.m., we're going to be reading at 33 Holly Street in Northampton. And what we're going to be doing is honoring three of the art partners in Holly Street, which is APE, eventual um, Available Potential Enterprises, the Northampton Center for the Arts, which has moved there, and the Northampton Community Television. We're going to honoring that, that conglomeration by reading poems related to other art, other pieces of literature, paintings, dance, music. So we'll be doing that. And then I'm very excited about an upcoming performance I'm involved in, which takes place on March 31st at 4 p.m. in the Hubbard Concert Hall in Cambridge, New York. And it's part of Music from Salem series, and it's going to include Lila Brown on viola, Judy Gordon on piano, and the actor-playwright John Haddon and I will be reading poetry. And we're going to be interlacing music and poetry around the subject of love. I think it's going to be pretty amazing. Wow. So I wanted people to know about that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we only have a minute here, and I, I, I don't know if we're going to really have time to talk about um, uh, how creative endeavors reflect your life, but it's, it's clear to me, beyond anything, that you're an incredibly creative person, and it obviously has um, been your life and yes. everything that you do, and it's really wonderful. Yes. You know, I think of writing and also poetry, you know, also my painting, as ways that I can have my life more fully, that it is through those, both of those arts that I explore some of the really large subjects of life. And, you know, for example, our mortality, love, passion, the suffering that goes on in the world, the loneliness that many of us feel, um, the mystery, the sacred. You know, my father was a minister. What is my relationship to God? What is the relationship to sacred? Those are very, very large subjects. And it keeps, you know, keeps me going and because it's, an, it's, it's eternally interesting to me. Right. Well, Margaret, I want to dearly thank you for being a guest on the show. It's well, been thank really you. Fascinating. My pleasure. Uh, I also want to thank Amherst Media for sponsoring my show. And um, I want to thank them for all the work they do in relation to this. And I hope to see you next time on Senior Moment. Thank you. Thank you.